good afternoon, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Actually, it's so many interesting topics that was talked before that I, I will try to keep me on time to select what would be important issues to, to talk. But right to the point, Abby, we are doing exactly what we're saying. Brazil is doing exactly what you said you should not do. So I'll go right to that point over here, show everybody that exactly that. We are taking advantage of our, of our population bonus. We have a social security system that given the population trends and the productivity that's going is not sustainable. But still, well, so that will be the, the, the bottom line of the talk in, in 30 minutes. So the structure I, 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 I outlined for today was these four topics. I will start showing some stylized facts on growth, poverty, and inequality in Brazil, and try to show or present to you, for you all, some what I'm calling mediate determinants of this poverty and inequality change, and at least some associations of what's, what's associated with that. And then I just to, to, to add some other topics, another additional issue in our discussion, I want to talk on the role of labor markets in this process, because not, not because less important or whatever, but I think could complement our the, the two previous presentations. I want to bring uh, to the table the discussion of, of the role of labor market and, and, and active policies in the labor market that could help uh, poverty reduction and, and inequality reduction as well. And then I'll go to what I call the challenges, and I will mention the, the three issues that are other more, but I think the demographics in Brazil, the role of productivity and related the, our education, even quantity and quality. Uh, so the first, the first thing, Brazil grew recently, which is not very common to probably lots of us here, but uh, the Brazilian the Brazil disease per capita GDP in, in dollar, in $1,000. Uh, we are about now uh, 11, 11, dollars per year. And we have been growing steadily since uh, 2000, 2001. And now we are stable for the last three years as particularly uh, almost no growth year. But actually for, uh, for after many years of slow growth or no growth, we have experienced a rapid economic growth for the last 15 years. This is new for the last 30 years. We grew 67, and then we did not grow. It grew slowly here, but then we really picked up in the beginning of the 2000s, and now we slow down again. But this process, in, uh, impressively, was associated with reduction on, on inequality in income, so Brazil has been very stable since 1976 when you have our household survey data to compute this Gini coefficient. And we're relatively stable, though, uh, you know, lots of fluctuations in the 80s. And, and, and then after, after 2000, then it started declining steadily. And it's true for any other measure of inequality you, you want to you wanna pick. I picked here this. And more importantly, as... as Professor Jerry Berman said, we care about poverty. And, and poverty has been declining steadily as well since the, the, the 2000, 2000. We have been uh, lots of volatility here. I mean, those that were in Brazil in the, in the 80s remember the Plano Cruzado, that we have a strong economic shock, but not sustainable. That's why this slow here. But then, and then the, the, the stabilization plan, the real plan, it dropped, dropped from 20% to 50%. Our, our uh, here's absolute poverty ratio, and then it stayed on 15 percent, and then steadily declined into until five percent. And in the last two years, we have been very stable here. But anyway, so the bottom line is, we grew, we reduced inequality, and we reduced poverty. So that that is the the the, the facts. The curious is that, of course, many countries that grew also also experienced reduction in poverty. I picked some, some selected countries here for, for 90s and 2000s. For instance, uh, Brazil, China, Chile, India, Mexico, South, South Africa have this annual growth. China, of course, 80%. And all of them, uh, using the poverty line of $2 a day, had a poverty decline through this period as well. So th there is uh, 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 everywhere you, you see in, in the data, wherever 
there is economic growth, is a poverty decline associated with that. What you don't see, what can vary, is change in inequality. For instance, Brazil had economic growth in the 60s and 70s, poverty reduction, but inequality increase. In, in, the, case of, uh, in the case of Brazil, this is, this is the case in the 70s where growth, uh, economic growth, inequality, uh, poverty reduction, but inequality is stable, a little bit increasing. And then what is new here for the, the recent years that you have these concomitant movements of economic growth with inequality reduction and poverty reduction. Well, there is a country that's growing a lot and inequality is going up, China. And this is a, a, a typical phenomenon that happened in Brazil in the 60s and 70s with urbanization, et cetera, migration for rural to urban area. This you can, you can see, but poverty is going down in China as well, but inequality increase. So what, what would, uh, why, why is that in Brazil? We had what probably we would love to have, which is economic growth with everybody along the income distribution is growing the, 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 the income is growing, but the poorer ones are growing faster than the richer ones. And that's what we want. We want people, at least if you care about poverty, we want those people with lower incomes. Here are the income distribution uh, uh, in this side. This is the first this side, the 10% poorest ones. And this is the top this side, the 10% richest one between 2001 and 2013. The Average annual growth of the first decile in Brazil was above 6% a year, whereas in the, the richest one was a little bit around 2% a year, and the average was a little bit above 3%. So this is the case where economic growth is associated with reduction in equality and reduction in poverty. Just to could give an idea what was happening in Brazil. By the way, we're saying here 6% a year of economic growth of the poorest one. But of course, the, the level of income is low, but the rate is, is, is very big. So picking the rate is as if in Brazil, in the last 15 years, the richest one in Brazil was, was growing as fast as Sweden. We have a Swedish here? No. So I should have picked another one then. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but we do have, no, we do have Chinese, yes. So we, the poorest ones in Brazil are growing as fast as Chinese, on av the average Chinese. So the, the dispersion of, of economic growth in the world we are experiencing within, within Brazil, basically. So there, because of this phenomenon, there is this surge in debate in Brazil, the rise of the new middle class, et cetera, et cetera, and there is lots of, of discussion what what, can, what explains this poverty reduction, the increase in the, this, this new middle class because it become less unequal, so we have more people you know, bunching together around the middle of the income distribution, et cetera. So we did some exercise here uh, on to get, let's say, approximate uh, uh, upper class, vulnerable class, lower middle class, middle class, et cetera, et cetera. So I used these cutoffs here, just to give you the idea of, for instance, in 2001, among the extreme poor ones, there were 14% of the population were extreme ones, were extreme poor. And in 2011, five, almost 6% were extreme poor. And then as you can see that, for instance, among here in the middle, which would be called the middle class people, we, we have uh, uh, an increase from 10% to 17, 9 to 14%. So what is associated with that? I'll, I'll do a, I did here a quick, uh, a quick decomposition of what are the factors associated with this decrease in poverty and decrease in, in, uh, decrease in poverty and basically, we divided the income distribution in, in groups, which you use in that cutoffs. So that, for instance, I will mention two things. I will fix these extreme poverty figures, the extreme poor ones, and I will take here one to be, let's say, I don't know, middle, middle. So those that among the poorest ones in Brazil, their income 
grew 14% a year between 2000 and 2011, using that figures of the Secretary of Strategic Affairs. So, picking that, that cutoff value, the, the first thing we did was look at the, how much the change in the poverty rate, so the change from 14 to 6%, how much of that change was associated with economic growth and how much was associated with inequality change. So one thing is, supposing the distribution, the, the, the shape of the, of the income distribution did not change across the time, but it moved to the right, the average income, the median income moved to the right. And second, the average income didn't change, but the shape of distribution changed. The first thing we call the growth component, the second distribution component. When you do this decomposition using a traditional decomposition in, in, in economics, in development economics, called data revaluing decomposition, we, we find that half of the poverty reduction, almost half of the poverty reduction, so if you, if you pick the poor here, who is exactly half, Half is due to, to the growth of the economy, and half is due to distribution component. What can you, if you, if you want to do some digression of that, what, what, how can we try to, to push for the, and, and do some interpretation of these results is saying, imagine there was no, no distribution policies, nothing involved, only economic growth. Poverty would be down by only half what actually went down only 50%. Associated with, associated with distributional policies, it actually went down the other half. So probably a good lesson here is, for some reason, I don't know why, it maybe is not, not intended, the combination of economic growth with a, some distributional policies, or welfare policies, I don't know, we have so many contradictory ones, lots of them here in Brazil, is a full of laboratories of of policies here, but that combination somehow got this result here. Another exercise we did was, was the following. Uh, we, we, we think we, we did a decomposition uh, uh, trying to see what were the, the, the elements, the factors associated with the increase of income of each part of the income distribution. So, what uh, perhaps the best way to go quick and explain this is the following. Pick the, the family per capita income can be, uh, can be associated or can be actually is almost an, as, an, as an identity, can, can be decomposed in the following four items. It is the family per capita income is the in family income per adult times the proportion of adults in the family, assuming child has no, no income, and the adult income can be divided in non-labor income and labor income. And of course, the labor income depends on those that are actually working, because it's labor income. So the share of occupied adults is important as well. Anyway, I do, don't want to do much digression uh, of, of if in the debate, if you, you all want to wanna discuss that. But my point only is to say that out of, of fixing the extreme poor ones first, this 14% increase of the incomes of the poor, the, year, the yearly increase of 14% is associated with, can be, almost entirely explained by two factors, the increase of non-labor income per adult and the increase of labor income per adult. So similar to the first decomposition, non-labor income and labor income were associated with the increase of the income of the poor. And if you pick, uh, if, if you look at this labor income per adult, occupied adult, you can see this is the main factor associated with the increase of income of the poor ones, including lower middle income or, or middle middle income, etc. Curiously, the, the, the explanation of the rise of the income of the poor is mostly increase of their adult incomes. Whereas, 
for the people in the middle, the rising middle class in Brazil, it is associated with the rise in the occupation. You can see per percentage of adults occupied. You can see here 34, 53%. And among those is explained by those occupied in the formal sector, in the private sector. So if you could, perhaps here we can see better. Uh, if you could uh, select two or three factors, we could select the fact that among the poor, non-labor and labor income are important. Among the people in the middle income, labor income was important. And what part of the labor income? Access to the formal sector jobs. So that is what explains the rising middle class in Brazil. The increase, increase in, in, the, in the formal sector jobs. They got more formal sector jobs. Who are the ones that got the formal sector jobs? Just being very quickly, those that are more educated. The increase in the schooling attainment of the younger generations in Brazil in the 90s and 2000s, those are the ones that got formal, got formal jobs in 2000s, and those that are the ones that formed the young families and the rise in the middle class in Brazil. So you, as, you, as you can see here in distribution, who are the formal ones? The majority are the young ones with higher education. So schooling has, to, has, has something to say here in this story. So that's why with, I decided to, to bring this issue of the labor market. So reduction in poverty in Brazil is association of economic growth with policy redistribution associated with labor income and no labor income. And the rising middle class is basically labor income. Just to give uh, another way to look at how labor income is important to the, to the change in, labor, in, in total income inequality in Brazil, we did a very quick decomposition of the Gini coefficient. Pick the Gini coefficient in 2001, and this is the Gini coefficient reduction of income in per, of inequality in per capita income down to 2012, so a steady decline. If there were no decline in labor income inequality, the reduction in inequality of total income would be much less. The contribution of labor income to the decline in equality is half of it. So our, somehow our labor market became, the distribution of labor earnings become less unequal. And associated with that in our labor market in Brazil, we have a reduction in unemployment, increase in, in, in wage and labor income as you saw, reduction in equality, and a big rise in, in, in the formality of that jobs. So we have a steady increase in the formal jobs and a, a decline in the proportion of informal workers the, in, in, our, in the labor force, Brazilian labor force. And interesting, the differential of, of the wage premium, let's say the wage gap of being formal in Brazil has been steadily in decline as well. So this is the this is the, the reduction. This, uh, for instance, let's pick for women. In 2002, uh, we controlling for, for anyway, controlling for many things, but basically, uh, women in the formal sector had a, about a little bit more than 50 percent higher wages comparatively to a women in the informal jobs, and this went down to to less, to I don't know seven percent, went down by half. Whereas for a man, although it's lower, but also decline, for decline almost by half as well. So in a way, what we call this probably is, this is indirect evidence of the segmentation of the labor market. The entering the formal sector somehow become easier. Okay, I think I was. Oh, I don't wanna explain much, but just uh, no, another point of of the labor how what the association between economic growth and, and, and this, just to make a point that uh, this combination of economic growth policies, distribution policies, it has to do also with 
macroeconomic stabilization possibly. Why, why I, I want to bring this here? Because this is a very interesting exercise where we decompose the, the variance of log earnings, a measure of inequality of earnings, in two components. We will call the we call the permanent component, the darker one, and the transitory component. So think of income changes by two things. People have different incomes because they have different permanent attributes. Education, schooling, their, their productivity long time. But also, they have different incomes because they have different shocks. Lose a job eventually or something happened unexpected in their lives that affect their their performance in the labor market, etc. That's what's called the transitory component. Interesting, in Brazil, during the, the, the unstable years of the beginning of the 90s, the transitory components most were the main determinants to explain the, the, the variation of earnings. And as the economy becomes more stable, the part of the, comp the, the permanent component becomes more important. So this is a quick decomposition of this. Between 1994 and 97, the variance decreased by 11%, but totally explained by the decrease in the transitory component. Macroeconomic stabilization is the main driving force behind it, probably. Whereas in 1998, 2009, with economic stabilization, we still have a, a decrease in the, in the inequality, now mostly driven by the reduction of inequality permanent component. So it I will not show you all here, but it also relates to our reduction in equality in schooling and the, incre and the reduction of the, the wage premium for schooling in Brazil. But then, so given, given this, this back, let's say this background information, 10 minutes? Yeah, okay, given this background information, just summarize and then let's go to challenge that where we really, really, can, can link what were presented before to what I'm saying. So when you look at this, here for the, this Brazilian experience, I mean, it's amazingly good figures. Economic growth, poverty reduction, inequality reduction. I didn't bring any other figures, otherwise we're gonna diverge with my point, but if you look at human development index in Brazil, really went down. You look, I'll show some figures, but you know, infant mortality, you name it. You name the, the, the any indicators. The, it's a, the millennial goals of the United Nations in Brazil. We beat them before the deadlines, most of them. So Brazil is seen as a great success. And many countries from Africa, wherever comes, go to the government, comes to FGV, and hey, what are you doing that we should do and copy? And actually, we want to learn from you know, what, what can learn from this experience. And actually. At least, I think we don't know. I mean, it was a combination of so many things that it's very hard to pinpoint what, exa what happened. We don't know what's a combination of all this. So when I, when I, I, I try to forecast and look ahead, okay, well, can we keep doing what we are doing and get the same results? That's what I think it probably is not. And that's what I want to show to you. And, and hope we can convince everybody that, well, maybe it's time to change, to not fall in a trap. So I don't know if it's, but I fall in a situation like in, in, in Japan. Because I think we are, what happened to Brazil, probably what happened to any other country that had an economic growth with, with the, the, the gains from growth was accurate to the poor ones for many reasons, but was not probably not sustainable, we need to change our institutions and how, how the, policy, the policy we have to, to spread the gains of growth probably will be not sufficient now or at least not adapted to the new situations we have ahead. That's what I wanna, wanna keep concentrated now until the end. Anyway, population growth. So let's go. We are, we are in the beginning of the 20th century we're about 17 million people, and then we grew steadily. And here is the, the we're growing, 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 and now we are about 200 million people. And these are the forecast. Okay, first thing. Uh, why that happens? We have a, a, a increase in, in birth rate and, and, a, and a reduction in, in 
well, we have, we have a steady growth birth rate in the beginning, but birth rate went down, but the death rate went even down. So the natural growth rate went up until here, and we for is already going down. So this explains the growth, this part here explains the growth of the population. And, and, and also we experienced uh, increase in the life expectancy, particularly driven by the reduction of infant mortality. I'll not go to the details, but that, that exactly what, what, what happened. And now the, some, some very curious things. We have had a, a, a very big decline in the fertility rates. So in 1960, uh, between 60 and 70s, we had on average six births per, I think, per woman. By now, we have less than two births per woman. And who are the all age groups have a uh, uh, reduction in the birth per women. So all age groups you can see here. And, uh, and as well, oh, this for, let's, for the age of the mother, etc. This is, this, I, I like these figures, not from me, from the uh, study of the World Bank doing uh, the, this implication of population age, but these figures for me tells, tell, tells everything. Imagine they did the, the, following, the following combination. Years to reduce fertility from, two, from three to two and increase life expectancy from 50 to 70. Look Brazil. Brazil took less than 20 years to reduce fertility from three to two and took 50 years to increase life expectancy from 50 to 70. This is the only country that really did very happen. So it was very quickly very, very quickly, our decline in, in, in infertility and increase in life expectancy. So, Abi maybe know, know, knows now that where I'm going. We are in the middle of our demographic bonus. Maybe all this growth, I don't know, is exactly take, taking advantage of this demographic bonus. So, look at this, this blue figures is the the number of the population between 50 and 59 years old by 2014 and of course forecast. And here the less than 15 or 60 years old. So of course the ratio of this is gonna give us the dependency ratio. And here in proportion, as you can see, keep the proportion, we have a very steady proportion of these two groups, age groups until 70. And then we're getting, you know, adult, less childhood, less old people, and then given our fertility rates and life expectancy changes, we're gonna have less adults and more old and, and young, particularly old. And why do we care? Exactly because of our social security and, and our social protection. Our social protection, so many different schemes that I don't wanna enter in the details here, but look the extreme poverty figures before transfers. That's the perfect incidence by age. And then when you do all our transfers, our, our transfers now goes more to old people than young people. So we do reduce a lot poverty among poor people, but do not reduce much among poor people. Imagine that I don't want to enter in that agenda that Professor Berman said about uh, investing in early childhood, which is a big issue here in Brazil too. But that's what we are, address, we are putting our money now. So, I mean, there's lots of, of figures about this. I don't wanna, I don't wanna take too, too much time on this. So we have this big issue of exponential increase in social security costs. Now, just because of the way our social security is designed now and how population is changing, it's gonna be exactly like Japan in expenditures in social security, et cetera. We already spent 12% of GDP on social security and pensions. And we spend a little bit less than 40% of GDP, so it'd be about one third as Japan figure now, without having Japan GDP and without having Japanese age structure. Imagine when you reach there. So this is a serious business. Regarding migration, when, when I saw 
Professor Berman, Berman point of migration. Migration could be one point here for Brazil, of course, and even migration of good qualified people. We were a very open country for people in the beginning of the 20th century. We had about 7.3% of first generation immigrants in 2000. This was uh, 19, yeah, 1900. Now we are down to 0.3% of immigrants first generation in Brazil. We are not only a closed economy for goods, for capital, we are closed for people, for ideas, for interactions in the world. Just to give some, 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 uh, some figures, now we have 0.6 million of immigrants comparatively for, for the whole world, immigrants who are similar to Professor Bremen's figure, 214 million. Uh, but I don't want to show this. I want to, oh no, what is the other figures? Uh, but anyway, so we, we and not, not only we have very few immigrants, but relatively to other accounts, our immigrants are also getting old, are also aging. So our, we, of our immigrants are above 65 years old, 36% of all, of all our immigrants are above 65 years old, much more than, than the rest of the world. But I'm taking too much time and I want to address two other issues. So imagine, we are aging, we still have a lower GDP comparative to developed countries, we are aging, and not only that, the productivity of our work, workers are not, although increasing, but not as increasing as fast as we would like. I'll go, I'll go straight to that. These are productivity, uh, productive, labor productivity for many countries. This is Brazil, yellow one, very stable. And this is, for instance, China, just reaching us. This is Japan. This is Korea. And our neighbors, Chile, Argentina, we still have not a lower, not only a lower level of productivity regarding comparative to other countries, but not growing, or not, not growing as fast as the others. Uh, I'll skip this. I, so for instance, just to, to, put, uh, uh, to emphasize this, this is the annual growth rate of average productivity of African countries, all African countries. Brazil is here. Brazil is above only these countries here. So even comparatively to Africa, our productivity is growing less than many African countries and our neighbors as well. Uh, uh, so why do we have this stagnated or at least low, low growth of productivity? Many reasons as well. I want to emphasize one and finish with that because one part is our education we are not delivering a good education in the country regarding quantity of education, years of schooling, and I want to talk about formal education. And, and these are enough big, uh, important figures to really care about. It, first, quantity, years of schooling. Brazil, and I don't know, I will compare Brazil now with Korea. Brazil, in 1960, the adult population had on average two years of schooling. Korea, about three. 2010, our adult population has seven years of schooling. Korea, almost 12. Why we have still lower than other ones? Many reasons, the most important one, finally all of our Brazilian kids start school at age six or seven, more than almost 100%. But they don't finish, or if they finish, they take long to finish. What do I mean by that? Pick, this is a World Bank figure. Of all our kids that start primary school, only 20% reach college, not even finish college. Chile, 30% of the population finish college. We are still now starting with 20. There are lo lots of things uh, to say. I will skip, I'll skip, I'll skip. And quality of education, not only we not having our kids and adolescents completing education, at least high school, we don't have that yet. But w even among those that are in school, they are not learning quite much. Br Brazil is, since 2003, in the PISA exam, I don't know how familiar are you, 
are you all with the PISA exam, but we, we can explain that. Uh, this is the, the, the PISA exam for, for mathematics. And this is from the PISA report. And here is Brazil. 2003, the scale of the math scores of all countries, average, Brazil was among the lowest ones. And here is the growth, the change in the scores between 2003 and 2012. Brazil is, um, it was the one that grew the most, but we were so in behind that we're still very in behind. And why we, and why, I think this is great news, but we have to grow even faster. And why, what explained this growth was basically that situation, this is coming from another study that I don't, didn't show here, is the situation from this blue line to this, I don't know, purple line, where we improved the flow of students across the system. Now we don't have too many delayed students, and that's what explains the improving in the proficiency. But still, even if you have all the students in the school and get the proficiency level of those that finish the school in the correct age, we would be very behind in proficiency. So my, to finish, conclude everything, thank you. Thank <laughs> you.